Muter. All right, I'd like to introduce to you tonight, Deborah Bros. Um, as I said in my email, she came onto my radar several years ago. I love all of her work with putting figurines together in different ways. And then on top of all that, she is a fabulous ceramic restorer. And I could actually totally say greater Austin clay artist because she was here in Austin for almost a decade. Was it a decade, Deborah? Um, eight years. Eight years, yes. And has moved on to Los Angeles, uh, my hometown, as it turns out. So I felt this definite uh, connection there. Mm -hmm. And with that, let me introduce Deborah Bros. And Hi, everyone. <laughs> hello, hello. So I'm to mute my audio now? Yeah, everybody should mute their audio. You do not have to stop your video because if we can see you do a hand wave and you want to ask a question, <laughs> that's helpful. <laughs> Deborah, do you, yeah. is it okay if people uh, interrupt or do you want to go through a whole spiel? No, people can interrupt if they want. Um, I, I'm not going to necessarily see you. I have my two screens going here, but um, Robin, feel free to like shout at me or people um, feel okay. free to, to interject. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of start out with um, like a little background about how I got into what I'm doing. Um, and then closer to the end, I'll tech, uh, talk more about my uh, technical processes. Um, so I'm guessing that people probably have more questions closer to the end, um, but feel free to, to jump in anytime if, if you, if you have burning questions. Um, and I think with that, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to share my screen. Oh, let um, me let you share it. Sorry. Oh yes. That's okay. <laughs> Go for it. Okay. All right. Um, one moment. Okay, and we'll do, all right. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so this first photo is just, to tell you a little bit more about my background, um, I was born in, well, okay, I was born in Arkansas, but I was raised through my entire life in rural Missouri. Um, and these cats are important to me. The white one um, actually was a cat that belonged to my grandmother. Um, and she uh, made the cat in her sister's uh, pottery shop where of course she, she poured the mold, she glazed the cat. Um, and then the second cat is an identical mold uh, that I found in Texas that in a goodwill, of course, was painted by somebody else. Um, but this photo to me sort of symbolizes um, this legacy of, of people doing mostly crafts. Um, I wouldn't say that anybody in my family was necessarily an artist per se, um, but um, I had this grandmother that made these ceramics and made tons and tons of crafts. Like I have a, I have a pet rock that she made me in 1983. That's still one of my special items with, you know, a little rock with googly eyes and a face on it. Um, my other grandma quilted extensively. Um, my grandfather made wooden crafts and novelties, um, doll houses, rocking horses, um, a really fabulous um, thing called the exploding outhouse, which is a trick bank. Um, and so I was growing up and my dad drew, like he really liked to draw. Um, my mom, although she doesn't draw, is also a creative person. So we're sort of, I was sort of surrounded with all this creativity and um, people who really encouraged me to, um, to, to be, to do art and be in art. And when I, um, became interested in that, you know, I, I had a lot of help um, getting there. So, so these cats are sort of my, my legacy, <laughs> a bit of what my legacy is. I actually have a third cat that I found in California about a year ago. Um, it's, a, it's a sitting up cat, but it's still in the similar vein. So now I have my three cats from this three states that I've lived in. Um, I don't count Arkansas. My parents left there when I was about six months old. So, and I haven't been there since. <laughs> 
Um, so I'm going to go just briefly go through some really early work. Um, if you knew me when I lived in Austin, I was there from 2005 until 2013. If you knew me when I lived there, you'll probably be familiar with some of this work. Um, I am a very unusual um, or no, non-traditional ceramic artist. I don't actually, I, I have some training in ceramics, um, but I don't actually do ceramics now. Um, I, even though I do sculpture and ceramics restoration, uh, it's all a different process than the actual use of clay and firing in a kiln and all that thing, all those kinds of things. Um, I, when I went to college, I really started out doing um, painting and some ceramics uh, and a lot of collage type of work. My work has al always been based in objects. So this first slide I'm gonna show you here are some photocopies of objects I collected um, that I used in paintings during college. Um, the image on the left is a dried and flattened mouse I found under a recycle bin. <laughs> um, the image on the right is the nest of, a, um, of an Oriole. Um, it, it's a really beautiful object made of um, grass and horse hair uh, that I found on my parents' property um, and I still have to this day. Of course, the center image is a saltine cracker, which was one of the um, items I subsisted on in college. Um, lots of Coca-Cola and saltine crackers. Um, and so even when I was making painting early on in college, I was just using found imagery. Um, found uh, found items, found imagery. I have big collections of things. Um, I tend to, everywhere I go, you know, I'm like, oh, I have a pocket full of rocks or I find an interesting stick or a piece of trash that I think is, is beautiful. Um, I think the nice thing about uh, having phones now is I can put these items on in photographs instead of actually picking them up and collecting them after moving, um, you know, a giant box of rocks rocks <laughs> through several states. Um, it, it, you know, it seems kind of strange to do. Um, so I'm not actually going to show you any of my paintings from college, but I just wanted to give you this, this background um, image. And then this next image is a couple of pieces of work that I did uh, in the early 2000s. I did a lot of work on paper, um, was collage based, uh, collage with drawing over it. Um, I don't know if, oh good, you can see my mouse. Like this element here, there's a hole burned in the paper and then this is actually stitching around it. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a, a self-portrait based um, little uh, print slash drawing. Um, so that's where my early work came from. Again, these are all images that I collected and then used um, uh, in my work. So this third image is gonna be a, um, a collaborative installation that I did in Austin with a group of friends in 2010, I believe. Um, and this is just another um, story of collecting. So what we did, um, uh, some of you might remember uh, the pump project in Austin. I helped ran, I helped run the pump project for um, probably six or seven years. Um, yeah, I guess my studio was there. So six years, my studio was there for six years and I helped run it. Um, so this was in their old building in their gallery. Um, a, a group of us, uh, uh, Shay Little, who I'm all you are familiar with, um, and some others, um, put a collaborative group together. And what we would do is just go into the room and say, like, how are we going to fill this gallery? And for this installation, what we did was we gathered um, interesting trash we found all over the neighborhood, um, which is this big pile of things. And then we created relief prints by painting one side of the image and printing it on the paper. Um, so this image here is each one of the prints. And then we had this big exhibit. People could come in and trace around um, an object that they thought was interesting and buy it for 25 cents per square inch. Um, so that's the type of uh, thinking that that has always involved me is like we we already live in this world with so many things and how can we translate these things into to something that makes it new or something that makes us see it in a different way again. Um, 
This fourth image is some installation work that I did with a friend of mine and also uh, an artist who still currently lives in Austin, but is gonna be moving to New Orleans shortly. Uh, his name is Mark Johnson. Um, this piece on the left is all books that I found in the $1 bin at Half Price Books. And they're all uh, about, they're all books about um, how to get yourself to sleep. So this piece was called Rip Van Winkle. For those of you who know the story of Rip Van, Rip Van Winkle, he fell asleep for years. So all the books are self-help books about how to sleep better. Um, and then this tree has grown out of the top of the books, uh, kind of symbolizing the time that he spent sleeping. And there's a little bit of text running down um, that says, that talks about how long he was asleep and, and what happened there. Um, the image here on the right is a collaborative piece that Mark and I put together. We both kind of got obsessed. We're both from the Midwest and we were sort of obsessed with this idea of, of fresh water and navigation. And um, we found on Craigslist a beat up canoe that someone was wanting to get rid of. Um, and so we had a show at the Dougherty Arts Center together. I believe it was in 2012. Um, and we uh, brought this canoe in and we, we wanted to do a piece about navigation, but also about being grounded in a place. So it's a dry canoe, uh, it's grounded. You could go in and sit in it. And when you sat down, you saw this little book, a handmade book that I'd made um, that was just full of images of water. Um, so even though you weren't actually in the water, you sat down in the, in the boat and you looked at these images of water and you could think about you know, navigating and movement and all that stuff. Um, so that's a little bit of background of what I was doing before and during um, the time that I started doing ceramics. So like these pieces are from uh, 2012. Um, I actually started doing ceramics restoration when I moved to Austin in uh, 2005, in the late part of 2005. Um, and then I actually started making the work that I make now. Um, the very first piece I made was actually in 2007, I believe. So this image just shows the duality that I've lived and worked in now for um, over a decade. Um, obviously the piece on the left is one of my sculptures, um, a little, little dancing dolphin. Um, the piece on the right, obviously at the top is the, it's a mice and cherub. <laughs> broken into several pieces. I'm getting some feedback. Yeah, I'm going to mute uh, Karen. Okay. Okay. I was Thank just you. making sure it wasn't me. Yeah, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, good. Um, yeah, so that's just a little mice and cherub. And then you can see on the bottom how he's been all put back together. Um, so I just, I, I live in this um, duality of fixing things and breaking things. And um and then restoring everything back to like it, like it was born that way. Um, and so just to go into a little bit to how I got into restoration work actually was um, when I moved to Austin, I didn't have a job. Um, and I just came there thinking it would be a, a cool place to live. I heard there was a, an interesting art scene happening. Um, and so I was excited about being there. Um, and I just happened to find an ad online, um, where someone said, you know, he'd been doing ceramics restoration for 30 years. He needed an assistant. Um, and he, you know, so he was looking for someone. So I came in to meet him and he said, well, you know, I've tried multiple times to find an assistant and I haven't found anyone who has been able to um really have the knack for this work it's it can be really tedious it can be really detailed you have to be really good at matching color you have to be great at putting back together um good at puzzles <laughs> and I love jigsaw puzzles <laughs> and so I thought well I can and I also happened to know I was good at color matching so I was like I can do this um and so I started working for him and I had a great knack for it. And he told me that the same, he's like, I can't believe that you've picked this up so quickly um, and done such a great job with it. And so I'd worked for him for a few months um, and I was out in a thrift store somewhere 
I can't remember, I wish I remember which store it was, but it was a thrift store in Austin. And I had, of course, as a person who collects things and also a person who never likes to spend money on new things, you know, kind of of the belief that everything we have is already here somewhere. We just have to find it. Um, so I was at a thrift store just looking for anything. And I came across um, these two really fabulous little lambs. And um, there's what they became. That was the first, the first object that I altered. Um, it was really interesting because what ended up happening was I, I took them back to the, the shop that I worked at where um, you know, I was doing restoration with this other person and I was really worried. So I was like, oh, I don't, I'm not sure what I'm doing here and I don't want him to see me just hacking apart figurines. That kind of seems like a not, you know, not, not very kosher being that we're supposed to be in the place where we fix things. But I was like, oh, I really have to try it. I mean, when I saw the two lambs, I just knew, um, I knew what they should be. And I thought a lot, I, I mean, even though that was already 2006, 2007, um, at the time, it reminded me of like all this talk that had happened with Dolly the sheep, um, the, the clone sheep that I think that happened around 99 or something like that. And the fear that surrounded it. And then also these like idealized figurines and how we interpret this, this um, like anthropomorphic um, idealized animal. Um, and so all those thoughts were kind of going through my head and I took it back to the shop and I didn't really know how to cut ceramic because that's not really something you learn when you do restoration. Um, and so I just started going at it and I thought, okay, well, you know, I really just need to cut the head off one and, and it'll be fine. I'll just stick it on. It'll look great. Um, that's not the way it works. Uh, what I've learned is it, like every form is, is, is a challenge. Um, if you want, I want the pieces to look natural. I want them to look like they were meant to be that way. Um, and because of that, you can't just really stick one thing on another thing. There's a lot of um, subtlety and work that happens in making things look, um, look true. So that's the first piece um, that I ever altered. And then it kind of just snowballed from there. Um, so here's just three. Something? Yes. How many mistakes to put that one together? <laughs> oh, I mean, a lot, um, because that one, I, first of all, it had a really challenging, I'll just go back, these little curls um, yeah. on the, the head. So like when I cut it apart, some of the ceramic fell away um, and or just disintegrated from the cutting. Um, and I needed to like re-sculpt it. And so those little curls were incredibly challenging. Um, I didn't break either of the heads. I, I was really lucky in that this first piece, um, it happens to be a piece of really soft pottery. Um, so it was pretty easy to cut. Um, some porcelain and things like that is very, very difficult to cut. So I got really lucky that neither one of them just cracked completely. Mm -hmm. um, I'm now thinking, I don't know what I did with the other body of the sheep. I don't have it now. Um, so maybe that broke, I don't remember, but it was definitely a learning process. And at that time I didn't have, um, I didn't have the same set of, or I had essentially the same set of materials, but there were some limitations to some of the fillers I was using. Um, and so that was a bit of a challenge to just figuring out how to get it to be filled in right and color matched right. Um, and I think even you can tell a little bit like this one doesn't have a perfect, didn't have a perfect color match or it may have been, may have yellowed a little bit over time. Um, but yeah, it was definitely substantially harder than I thought it would be to make it look the way I wanted it to look. <laughs> um, and so I kind of, you know, seeing this, um, and comparative to my other work, which was always very uh, quiet and thoughtful. To me, these types of pieces seemed, you know, almost like too loud and too funny and too silly. Um, and so I was almost like afraid of them in a strange, like I was afraid of, of this work and like what it was and what it meant for who I was supposed to be. It didn't seem very serious to me. And I guess that 
that's that's the the point in time I am. I often now refer to myself as as being a comedian, um, and this is <laughs> sort of when I came into that. Um, so there's three, and of course that's a little bit facetious, but you know I do try to be funny. Yeah. Um, so there's three quotes here um, that I, I feel are, are pretty telling for me. The first one is from Kurt Vonnegut, um, who's a, my favorite writer. Uh, Humor is the soul seeking some relief. And so I think, I think about that a lot, like how we can use what's silly or what's a little bit funny um, or what has lightness to it to kind of take take our minds to, to another place that might be more serious or more complex. Or it's also a way to think about something complex without like bringing everything down immediately. Um, the next quote is from the sculptor Eva Hesse. It was from a documentary that was put out about her a couple of years ago. Um, I, don't, I didn't write down, of course, the sculpture that she was referencing, but she says, it's the most ridiculous sculpture I've ever made and that's why it's so good. And I've so often felt that when I'm putting something together and I'm just like, this seems like complete nonsense. There's something so beautiful about the feeling of just making something that you think is total nonsense and maybe even seeing it in a different light later and realizing it may not be complete nonsense, but just, um, you know, putting two totally opposing forces together in some way. Um, and then of course the quote from John Waters, humor is always the best defense and weapon. Um, and so, you know, that just goes back to being able to use um, the silliness, the silliness of the world to protect ourselves and defend ourselves. Um, and so I'm gonna show you a few images of just, um, some general ceramic works. These two are older pieces, um, but this is a good illustration of, uh, you can see that the head of the pink parrot is used on the body of the rabbit and the image on the left. Um, and then on the second image, uh, the body of the parrot is used on the pieces of the cow. Um, the pieces of the cow were a gift from someone, which was really um, lovely. I love it when people break things. And then this person happened to collect salt and pepper shakers. I and I guess creamers, I think this one was a creamer. Um, and when I made the, her, the cow, um, I loved how she kind of looks like a dinosaur and how birds and dinosaurs are related or the same thing. I don't know, related or the same thing. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> but so she stand, you know, stands on two legs and it's very like stately and, um, and then this, you know, little parrot rabbit is just a little oddity and you can kind of imagine it like hopping around, but also acting like a parrot. Um, so I think a lot, even though I don't, you know, write the stories of these objects, I think they're sort of written within them. Um, and, and so I always have quite a bit to say about what, it, what this animal would be like if it was alive. Um, so that's one of the processes I use is just a kind of a pretty straight up combination. Um, then these two um, just show an additive process, uh, extra legs on the pig here more extra legs on the dog. Um, so these are all, this was actually at a point in time where I always was sculpting everything from scratch. Now, occasionally I'll use a mold to match a piece. Um, but in these cases, I, like all of these, these extra feet are all hand sculpted, same here. Um, the piece on the left was, that was sort of interesting because I had someone making a documentary about my, a short documentary about my work and she filmed me start to finish making this pig, which is normally not how I work. I start something, I stop it, work on it more, stop again. Um, but she wanted to just sit with me until I finished it. I got it nearly done. I didn't like how it looked and I took a hammer and hit one of the legs so it would fall off and I could put it back on where it looked better. Um, <clears throat> it's very important to me because the works are sculpture that they look good in the round. You know, they're not supposed to be one-sided thing. Um, so another big thing about my work is serendipity. Like there's nothing I love more than finding something broken and having something broken and being able to like merge the things into to something that seems perfect. And that's how this piece came together. Um, there's three hands. Um, so one horse has two hands, one horse has one. Um, I had that box of hands 
my old boss, uh, who I did restoration for, he had given me a couple of really, really damaged figurines, like if I needed to practice restoration. Um, and I never did, uh, <laughs> but I had this little box that had these hands in it. And I, um, and I had them for years and years when I moved to LA in 2000, 2014, I went to some yard sale and they had a table of, you know, like the, the garbage table that's in the backyard with the things that nobody wants. And both these horses were there and they'd already been broken. They had three breaks and I saw them and I knew that the scale was just perfect for those hands that I had. So I went home and went into my studio and had to dig out this, this box of hands that I had for, you know, eight, eight or 10 years or whatever. Um, so this next image, um, a lot of the work I do is also about things that are inspired by or things that actually happen in nature. Um, so the duck, uh, there's a process that happens in nature. It's called a vestigial twin, um, where uh, one animal where there will be a set of twins supposed to be born, but one embryo kind of sucks in the other embryo. And there's an, actually an animal that comes out that has like extra legs, um, usually not an extra head and it's not terribly extreme. Um, but that was based on that process of vest vestigial twins, um, which I just think is really interesting. Um, something nature is always trying to, to change everything. And I think we get so involved in this idea of, of what is normal or what's supposed, what's right. Um, but nature's goal is to always change, is to make everything different, like to make it, I mean, not even necessarily better, but just like the process of evolution is change. Um, so that comes up a lot for me. Uh, the other piece He's called the trophy buck. He's a little guy, but he has a huge rack of antlers, obviously. Um, that was based on a story I heard about this animal called the Irish elk. That was like an ancient animal that supposedly um, was, uh, had horns so big that eventually it was unable to eat. They thought that's why it went extinct because it couldn't bend its head down far enough to, to graze. However, I just saw a show on PBS where they happened to mention that really what happened was there was like a climate change and it just didn't survive. Um, it didn't have anything to do with its antlers being too big for its head. So, you know, there's these stories we tell ourselves yeah. um, or that science sometimes tells us before they figure out the right thing. Um, so this is another piece that's based on genetics. This is a normal rock, Norman Rockwell figurine and another case of um, serendipitous um, finding. Um, so we have the, the crab man with the crab hand and his little crab son. I like the idea where he's kind of pondering, like, I have a crab hand and my son is part crab. I wonder if it could be related. <laughs> um, I made this piece probably a year and a half ago. Um, and it was sort of related to so much like science denial happening and people kind of not wanting to believe how, how all of this stuff works. Um, and I just, it, it's always fun to alter a Norman Rockwell figurine because they're meant to be so benign. I mean, the original figurine, that man was looking at like uh, what was supposed to be his bills, you know, like being really concerned, like, oh, I have a wife and family and I have these bills. But luckily when I picked him up at the thrift store, his hand with his bills was already gone. Um, his son's little arm was already gone. So I, you know, I just made them a little better, a little funnier. Um, and then these pieces are um, what I call hybrids. Um, my, my mom and my, my dad are both really big into to gardening. Um, they don't do plant breeding, but they just love gardening. We always had tons and tons of flowers in the yard growing up. And also everyone in my family is really interested in birds. Um, so I started making these pieces that are, that are bird flower hybrids. Um, and there's like so much interesting stuff that happened through time with like the Dutch and the tulips, the tulip wars and, and um, how, what lengths people go to to get a thing to look a certain way. Um, I also like this idea of birds being pollinators and, and accessing, you know, accessing flowers and things like that. Um, and so that's what, and also the piece on the, um, the piece on the left with the yellow bird 
um, it reminds me so much of, there's a sculpture called Daphne and Apollo, or wait, it's, yeah, it's Daphne and Apollo, is it? Oh shoot, I should have written it down. Well, anyway, she turns into a laurel tree when he touches her. And it's a Bernini sculpture, uh, like a Renaissance Bernini sculpture. And she reaches her arm up and it's turning into all these branches. And to me, um, this piece was, was somehow connected to that, that idea of like turning into a tree. And the reason she turned into a tree was because she was being saved. Her father was saving her from Apollo trying to attack her. Um, and the way he saved her was to turn her into a tree. Um, and I kind of think that's a nice concept too, because uh, I, I just like that idea of, of trees being not a timeless thing, but they live such a long time and they have, um, I don't know, they have things going on that we can't necessarily understand, which I just think is fascinating. Um, this next piece is, um, dinosaur reading a book about asteroids. Um, this is one of the few works I've recently started doing a few works that are done with ceramic figurines and plastic toys. So this is actually a plastic dinosaur on a ceramic figurine. Um, it's a little bit difficult to see in the slide, but the book he's reading actually has a, has the little earth here and an asteroid coming to it. And so he's, it's an artist's rendition, it says on the um, in there. So he's, he's reading about his own demise. Um, and I feel like there's been so much of that. This was actually one of the um, pieces that I made in the first part of 2020, <laughs> when we were all uh, sort of, uh, when the pandemic began, and we were all sort of stuck where we were. And, uh, and somehow, the, the more I knew about things, like, even if you know, it's really bad, it can be so comforting to know. Um, like to, to have the knowledge of, like, even if it is of your own demise, I think it's about like, like learning about climate change. You know, it's about reading about your own, <laughs> your own potential demise or the demise of the race, but somehow it's, it's comforting to have the, the extra information. Um, now this uh, is a studio shot from a series of rabbits, uh, white rabbits that I did. Um, in 2019 for a show here in LA. Um, this was the first time, so up until this point, up until 2019, I always found stuff at thrift stores. I never, I never bought things on eBay. Everything was just, I had to find it in the wild. I was obsessed with the idea of like finding this, finding things in nature. Um, you know, finding things were definitely just going, you know, probably gonna go to the landfill. Um, but then I, I, I don't know. I realized that was kind of nonsense. I think sometimes you make these rules for yourself within your own art. Um, and those rules are pointless. Uh, <laughs> or I mean, like they, they have a, a time and a reason and then, you know, rules are made to be broken, I suppose. Um, so years and years ago, actually the first slide I showed you of the parrot and the rabbit, um, that rabbit is made by a company called Lefton uh, that made ceramics like through the 60s probably. And so I found a pair of those Lefton rabbits that I did use for um, the piece I showed you earlier back in 2009 or 2010. Um, and I remembered the company name and I had always loved those rabbits. And I just thought they were so, the form, they, this form was so perfect and they were a pair. There was a sitting one and a standing one. And so when I started thinking about what I wanted to do for this show, um, I realized if I could get the same object and create all these different iterations of the same object and kind of test, test the idea of like, when does a rabbit stop being a rabbit? When does a rabbit become something other? Or when does this object become something other than what it is? Like, how far can you go? What can you do? Um, how many alterations can you make? And the funny thing I found was that they are all, no matter what I did, they were all still rabbits. Um, so that's just them all kind of being together, some altered, some not altered. Um, here are two of the, there ended up being 25. Um, so here are two of them, um, a merged one here. And then this one, I actually did, um, molds of the ears um, and reproduced them. Um, so I could have, you know, the, the perfect left in ears. 
um, for this guy. He's also, I call him the sea urchin. Uh, <laughs> he's, he has that, that kind of, you know, spiky look to him. Um, and then here's three, <laughs> three pretty simple ones. Um, yeah. But, you know, just another uh, set of the iterative series. And in this last slide, I'm gonna show you because it can be really hard to understand the scale of my work um, when you're seeing it, you know, on online or whatever. Um, so this, this next slide is just gonna be an installation view of what the rabbits looked like in the gallery space. And they are tiny. Uh, <laughs> they're on two shelves. Um, so there ended up being four shelves on adjacent walls. Um, I had the walls painted pink, um, and, but you can see how diminutive everything is. And that's that's been a big, even when I was working in painting or collage, I tended to work small. Um, and I always liked, as a kid, I collected miniatures. I loved small things. I love small things still. I love things you can hold in your hand and really look at. Um, and so the scale of the work, I hear so often like, why don't you make it bigger? Like make something bigger, make something bigger. I honestly have very little interest in making bigger things. Like I don't need big things. I like little things. Um, and with little things, you can have this focus that you would never have with something that's enormous. Um, and, I, and I also am so grateful to um, Track 16 Gallery where I did show this work um, for letting me put tiny things into their gallery instead of saying like, oh, you need to have this space filled in a certain way. Um, and so then we're gonna kind of go into nonsense land here. Um, so this was a piece I made just a couple of years ago. These are carrot babies, um, baby carrot, carrot babies. Um, for the, these, again, the babies, I found one um, in a thrift store. And then probably a year and a half later, I found the second one. And I found a big bunch of carrots that's on the, um, it's, it's like they're, you've, I'm sure all of you have seen them. They're uh, kind of strung up on like twine and it, people hang them in their kitchens as decorations. I'd never seen all carrots before, but this one happened to be all carrots. They also have like lemons and garlic and things like that. Um, and for this one, I just thought it would be funny. Um, I just wanted to make something that I thought was just funny and bizarre. And like, how do those grow? Like, are they supposed to be? carrots are I mean like what what happens like do they regrow their legs if you eat the carrots I don't know um <laughs> and there's and I love that they were facing each other and it's so this is just sort of about silliness more than anything um but it just ties back into that whole humor thing and there's another couple of pieces that are really just inspired by like cartoons and jokes about animals um there's a cat trapped under a mouse cheese um, so the mouse has finally defeated the cat, just like we all saw in Tom and Jerry and all this stuff. The second image is um, a cat scaring another cat by wearing a mouse mask. Um, and so I did, and then this next image um, is a dog dressed up in a duck costume. I've done a few of these pieces where instead of actually merging, um, merging the pieces seamlessly, um, I turn them into uh, all right, I give them costumes. Mm -hmm. And so I really liked the idea of costumes. Uh, the, they're nearly as difficult to do as like the complete transformation of a piece. So that was sort of an interesting process. It also leads in this idea of costumes. I found an easier way to do costumes. And these are some things that I'm working on now and that don't have anything to do with ceramic, but I thought you, you all would want to see them anyway. So you can see um, sort of how the trajectory is going. Um, so there is, uh, in, my, in my thrift store life, I ran across, I run across so many stuffed animals. And the thing I love about the ceramics is they're so important to people and meaningful to people. Um, but that's also the same way with stuffed animals. You know, like when we're kids, we love our stuffed animals. They're so important to us. We wanna sleep with them. We wanna be with them. Um, and then we're done, you know? And it, and it becomes the same way. Like when someone that collects a lot of figurines passes away, their relatives were like, oh, I never really liked chickens. And they just take, you know, they put them all in a box and they take them to Goodwill and it, and it's sad. Uh, <laughs> and so I started 
started collecting stuffed animals um, and thinking about this whole idea of costume. And, um, and so the image on the left is the ceramic dog dressed up as a dog. Um, I also like this concept of dressing up as yourself or dressing up as an, an iteration of yourself, which is kind of something that we just all do anyway. Um, you know, with social media or whatever, like make yourself look better than yourself. Uh, <laughs> and then the, and so then I got kind of obsessed with the idea of finding these gigantic stuffed animals and being like, oh, I can make this into a costume. Um, and so I've been making like some costumes for myself with these human animal hybrids, which I know are super weird, but um, I just, I think it's, the use of the comfort object is so strange. And then the, the like idea of human skin and the stuffed animal skin is, is odd. Um, so this was just a recent, these are all just uh, photos I, I put together in my studio. So this, the one with the puppies was a recent photo that I did. Um, and again, those are just about, they're about humor. They're about being something other than yourself. Um, and so then from, that last year, um, again, during the pandemic, LA started doing a lot of uh, drive-by, drive-through art shows. Um, and the studio I was in at the time, my studio mates it was like, hey, there's gonna be a drive-by art show that's happening, you know, that's gonna happen around our, our studio, we should get in on it. I was like, okay, that's a great idea. I'm not gonna put tiny ceramics in an alley for someone to see from their car, that doesn't make any <laughs> sense. Um, so I started thinking about what I was going to do and I, and I walked back into the alley and I found, um, some old furniture that someone had thrown, you know, just like trashed back there or whatever. And it was all a mess and all grassy. And, and I, and I, there was a, a chair and a dresser and I started thinking about it. And it's like, you know, I think I can do something with these. And I wasn't sure what I was going to do, but what I ended up doing, um, is starting to make stuffed animal furniture. Um, so this piece in the center was actually the piece that I first made for uh, that drive-by art show. Um, it was that piece along with a chair that was made of, or the chair that I found in the alley with soft uh, stuffed dolphin parts sewn all over it. Um, and I kind of got enamored of this, I'm just really enamored of this idea that everything, sort of this like philosophical idea that also just ties into like what we know about physics and dimensions now where everything is itself and it isn't itself at the same time like all things are different and all things are the same um and that's sort of how this is all coming together like I I want to I want to visualize it in real time um taking something <laughs> taking that process of making one thing something else and being, and being kind of like silly about it and funny about it. So, um, oh, I think, okay. So I made these other, so I made these other two pieces. And again, we're still in LA dr doing these drive-by shows. Um, and so the gallery that I'd shown the rabbits with um, was going to be part of this um, event called High Beams, which was a drive-through art show on the top of a parking garage. And so, um, the guy that owned the gallery was like, so do you want to, do you want to, you know, make some more of that furniture and do a little installation for this drive-by show? So I was like, okay. So I started putting the furniture together. Um, and the result, this was at night. So like people drove around the top of the parking garage in their cars with their headlights on. And that's how they saw the work. Um, and that's my installation for that. Um, so you can see those three pieces, but then what I had done was I'd made all this stuff and, you know, I was like, well, it doesn't seem quite complete. So it was like, it needs a rug. Um, and so I was like, oh, of course I can be a rug. Um, I have a bear suit. Um, and so, so this was the, the installation for that show where I became, um, became part of the installation and really loved like tying that the human furniture stuffed animal element, like all wrapped up into one. Um, I made some lamps here. Uh, this is not the greatest picture because of course it was at night, but um, that, so that's a lot of what I've been doing lately. I've still been also doing a ton of ceramics, um, but what's kind of happening for the future is the, this whole combination of, of all those things. Now I'm going to show you a terrifying photo of my studio. 
<laughs> it's a mess. Um, it's getting better. I'm having some shelving built right now. Um, but this is sort of, I sort of just live in a wild mess of, um, stuffed animals and ceramics and furniture I find. And then, you know, I like work back here in this back corner. This is right after I moved in. It looks a little better now than it did. Um, but I feel like sometimes people are a little unrealistic about showing their studio photos. So this is like real life. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Where in LA is your studio? What area? Um, so this studio, it's it's a little bit east of downtown. It's off of Mission Road. Um, okay. It's in the Lincoln. It's in the Lincoln Park neighborhood by um, by USC Medical Center. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So. So that's where I'm at. Um, the, and you know, when I found the studio, I was so excited because one, it was cheaper than what I was paying before. And two, it had a skylight, which is amazing because I do really need that light for color matching. Um, and so I don't even have to put up any artificial light. I can just use a natural light, which is amazing. Um, so now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. I'm gonna show you just a few restoration photos and kind of go through some of my materials. Um, can I ask a question before you go all the way over? And you can tell me if you're gonna talk about it. <laughs> you were talking about making molds for the bunny ears. Are you gonna get mm -hmm. to talking about that at all? Yeah, I can talk about, um, I can talk about the materials I use. Would you just, when I, there's a few slides where I actually show um, pictures of materials, just give me a shout and I'll, okay. unless, unless I might remember, but if I don't remember, just okay. be like, hey, talk about molds. Okay, uh, great. <laughs> so it, there's just going to be three qu quick slides of restoration work. Generally restoration work, I mean, like, this looks impressive because it was in a lot of pieces. It was a lot of work. Um, this is a very, very old piece. The glazes um, were all pigment based and really chalky. So it was very difficult to, to actually match, um, match the color. I had to use dry pigments ground up um, in order to make that one happen. Um, right now, I and most of the time with restorations, what I fix are like little chips or something like that. I, there, it's rare that something is, you know, in 50 pieces, um, although I do do those things too. Um, so this is just an image. I like this piece a lot. It's, it's, um, I forget. Oh, it's called a cocoon jar, which I just like the name. And I think it's a really pretty piece. Um, this is just a, <laughs> this is a mid-century modern Malcolm Leland um, ceramic. California is obsessed with mid-century. Um, so this is a, is a, is a, bird shelter, bird house, as we call them in the Midwest. Um, here in LA, they're bird shelters. <laughs> but, you know, this, uh, this was just something I'd done recently that I happened to find a photo of. Um, I try to be good about taking photos and I'm very, very bad at it. So I don't really keep a lot of photos of things I've restored. Um, but you can see there how many pieces it was in. And then of course, you know, it came back together really well. Um, just because I know people are curious, restorations can be um, pretty stable actually for like, this is hanging under an eave. Um, so it won't get a lot of, it won't get a lot of sun. It won't get a lot of rain. Um, so it'll remain pretty stable over time. Um, it'll take, a, like eventually the restoration will break down but it'll take quite a while. Um, like years and years and years and years. Um, so that's that. Uh, this is just uh, one I felt like showing because you can see, so this piece was, um, had been restored by someone else, then broken again in an identical place. Um, but depending on what your color looks like on your screen, this is much, much more yellow uh, because the person that restored it um, restorations previous to like mm, 20 years ago, uh, usually used like oil-based paints and, um, finishes that yellowed a lot more than what we have now. Um, so, you know, this person might've been bad at matching color, um, or they just might've, you know, put a finish on that yellowed over time. Um, so you can see like how yellow she was here when I glued her head back on in comparison to how pale she at her real coloring is. I can't, depending on which screen you're on, you may not be able to tell, but you know, that's, that's just a note I like to make. Um, a big thing with restorations is missed, like a way to notice restorations is bad color. Um, okay, so now just a little bit about the materials I use. Um, this is 
this is the first steps. <laughs> um, I didn't put a picture of the epoxy or the glues I use, but oftentimes I use it. I usually use a two-part epoxy, um, not the one in the syringe. I use the one that's in separate containers. If you've ever used epoxy in a syringe, it's a nightmare. I don't even know why they sell it. Mm -hmm. um, anyhow, uh, <laughs> so two separate bottles is the way to go. So I normally use a, a quick setting epoxy for gluing things. It depends on what it is though. Um, there's a variety of types of glues for different different types of um, materials, but most of the time it's two-part epoxy. Um, for filling in um, and for sculpting, like a lot of the sculpting that I do, um, I use, this is a two-part um, resin and hardener and you mix it up, like you get equal parts, you mix it up into two little balls or equal size, mix them together. Um, it takes several hours, you have several hours of working time usually, depending on how hot it is. Um, it dries chemically, but the heat expedites the drying time. Um, and so you're able to sculpt it while it's wet. Uh, you can actually use water to smooth it, um, sculpting tools, and then um, uh, it, at once it's dry, you can actually sand it. Um, so this is my Dremel, which is my best friend. Um, I, I, this is, this photo does not show the cutting bit that I normally use, um, but I use a rotary cutting bit. Uh, it's a diamond bit. They just started making it about 10 years ago. They didn't have it before. So I used to use these little cutting wheels, which are no good. Um, spend the $25 and get the diamond cutting bit. That's where it's at. Um, and then these are all my little tiny sanding tools, um, all kinds of sandpaper, toothpicks, Q-tips, dental tools. Um, those are all great for sculpting, smoothing, um, different grades of sandpaper uh, for restorations and repairing things or just making seamless, um, seamless things happen. You really need to go through and make sure that you've sculpted and sanded it properly before you put any kind of color or paint down. Um, so this, I use the cheapest airbrush because I'm really bad at cleaning things. Um, and if I'm not gonna pay for a really expensive airbrush and then ruin it, so I use a cheap one. This is just a single action airbrush. Um, airbrush I use for painting large areas of things. If you need, if you're, if you're repairing something like a white plate, it's cracked down the center. If you need to have a really good blend um, and the airbrush, the way the paint comes out can help you get that really seamless blend. So that's how I do that. Um, paints on the left side. In this case, I was painting something that had like a really complicated green glaze. And so I mixed up a whole bunch of different types of greens um, to get the different layering effects that I needed. Um, and so then I use golden fluid acrylics, mostly um, watered down for the airbrush. Um, I use a lot of different mediums. I use a lot of matte medium because it has body and can help fill some of the little pits and inconsistencies in ceramics. Um, and then I do a lot of brush painting for details. So on the right is just how my palette normally looks um, for doing brush painting. Um, I don't have a photo of the um, mold making material I use, but I'm remembering to talk about it. So good for me. Um, <laughs> but I do very, I do very, very simple molds. Um, I usually use um, a silicone. It's, it's a silicone compound. My studio is not arranged right now, so I can't see the name of it, um, but it's basically a two part um, clay. It's purple um, or it's, it, it works like a clay. Again, you like mix two equal parts of it. And then um, I only do simple molds. So that's just like um, ones that can be like split down the middle um, and don't have like a weird arm sticking out or something like that. Um, so you just cover the object with that material, um, press it on really good. The mold material sets up usually in about like 20 minutes. It's pretty fast. Um, pull that off and then I um, use a resin. Um, so like a liquid resin, um, a lot of it's the same type of stuff they use for jewelry or whatever. I use the white resin. Um, again, it's two parts. You mix it up, you pour it into the mold. Um, and then because the silicone mold is very flexible, um, pour it in, wait for it to harden, and you can just kind of pop the, pop the piece right out of the mold. Um, and the molds don't last, they don't last forever. They're pretty temporary. So the rabbit I did with all the ears, 
I think I actually ended up making a mold twice um, because after I had used it several, I used it a few times and popped the piece out and the mold will like rip, it ripped. Um, and so it was leaking and, you know, um, and you do get like a bit of a seam line where you have to, to carve something off or clip yeah. it um, to make it look better. Um, so I'm almost through here. Um, this is just an example of what my tabletop usually looks like. Like these are a bunch of things that aren't, that aren't my things yet. <laughs> things <laughs> I found and things I kept. I literally keep crates, like many, many crates of objects. And then I get them all, I'll get a bunch of them out if I'm thinking about some type of thing or if I found a new object and I know I want it to be together with something else, I'll go through and be like, okay, you know, what do I have in my dog's box? And I'll get out all my dogs and see what kind of scales fit together. Um, and let's see. So this is a pre, um, you know, I never really had anybody ask me before, like, what do things look like before you do anything to them? Um, but I, I did a show in Philadelphia recently and the gallerist was asking me, did they had a client? It was like, oh, can you see what the pieces looked like before? Like, I don't even take pictures of that. <laughs> um, but in this one, it happens to because again, especially because of the pandemic, um, I had a, a show at the end of 2020 and I really wasn't able to go out thrifting like I normally would. And because of that, I uh, had to do a lot of eBay shopping, which I learned eBay shopping, just unbridled eBay shopping, when you're just looking, looking for something that's going to, you know, inspire you or whatever, is nearly as difficult as just driving to 20 thrift stores. Oh, um, yeah. The objects are much harder to find than you think. Um, so anyway, <laughs> so um, I had gotten these two little guys, and the pieces I ended up making are this horse cat family. Um, who I love. I don't know, for some reason, other people don't love them as much as I do. Um, but I always sort of loved Siamese cats or the concept of Siamese cats. Um, and so the one I made first is actually this one with the baby. All I had done initially, I was like, oh, I'll put some horse legs on her. Isn't she sweet? And then I thought, oh my God, she should have a horse baby. Um, <laughs> again, this is how like my genetics tie in. And so then this is its other parent who also has a horse face. Um, and as you can see, I'm very amused by that. Um, here's another piece, like a, a kind of a beginning of, of thinking about a piece and then how it ended up being finished. Um, I happened to buy a, a like a, a, like a box lot of poodles that had like four poodles, um, together. And so I decided I wanted to make this the poodle peed, um, centipede poodle type of guy. And so here I was just kind of looking to see how the scale fit together, if the scale would work. Um, and then here's how the finished piece turned out. This is really interesting because I feel like you, you would think looking at it, you're just like, oh, you just chop off the legs and glue them on and you're done. Um, it was a mess. It's a mess. It was a mess underneath. Like the underside looks great now, but it there was a lot of extra finishing work, like hours of finishing work that got put into covering up all these seams and also making sure that the feet all hit the ground in the way that they were supposed to. Um, and so here's another piece just like started and then finished. Um, I used to also have this thing where I didn't really do a lot of extra painting on the objects. I do want them to stay pretty true to what they began as. Um, so a lot of times I leave the faces very much the same. Um, but like for this one, you know, the legs on the original ballerina figurine were white and I, you know, like in tights and I just didn't like that. And so you can also see here, this is a pretty rough build um, that was happening. So that ended up getting like extended and then all smoothed out in the end to make her look right. Yeah. Um, and then this is just one final um, kind of in progress shot. Um, of two more horse cats. I got into the horse cats. I'm still on the horse cats. Still only I like the horse cats, but, uh, <laughs> but there's going to be more. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I chose to show you this because this just shows, you can see a wire sticking out here, a little wire armature. Um, oh, yeah. This leg came off and glued on fine. This one did not. I had to make a whole knee for it. So that's how it started. Um, 
this one, I had this very, very broken cat that I hadn't used for a long time and decided I wanted to put it with this horse. The horse had a weird finish. Like you can see there's a big chunk missing out of the head. So there was a lot of like filling and finish work to do there. And this is how they turned oh, out. So I really ended up doing a lot of painting on this one. Yeah. Um, I decided when I started working on it, it should look like it's a tabby. So I was like, oh, it's a horse and it's a tabby. So it should really be more like a zebra. Um, and that's sort of how that train of thought went there. A um, couple more. This was for my show in Philadelphia. This was a group show. So there's paintings here in the background by an artist called Andre Scholz, who's from Germany. Um, he actually does um, new paintings over top of vintage paintings. Um, so his stuff's really cool, but this is a, a goldfish donkey. And this also just kind of gives you an idea of what the scale looks like um, uh, at, as far as my work goes. And then um, here's a bunch of sculptures all together before they traveled in a box to Philadelphia for a show that I didn't get to go to because it still wasn't safe to travel. <laughs> um, and then that last one. Um, so that's just my website. Actually, if you just visit DeborahBros.com, that links to my restoration website as well. Um, I am a avid Instagram poster, um, not so much on Facebook, but you can find me on Facebook. You'll see me occasionally. Um, if you really want to know what I'm up to, you should check Instagram. Um, and occasionally I do send out an email if I have shows coming up. So that is all I have for you. So I'm going to, um, oh, there's a photo of me and my furniture. Yeah. Um, yeah. There we go. All right. Stop I shit. absolutely <laughs> love the development from start to finish. That is awesome. Well, All hopefully right. that was like informative and not too long. And if um, anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. All right. Everybody unmute and ask. <laughs> and if you don't want to speak, you can put it in the chat and I'll ask her. Would you like donations of crappy ceramics yeah so people often do send me um also hi nancy um <laughs> people do my, often send my, me um my send me ceramics. yeah yeah so so i do i i mean i'll take anything i will take anything anyone will give me be, just because that is my nature of my hoarding however the things that I most look for <laughs> are things that have appendages. So a lot of the ceramics that have been made lately are very globby, you know, like a lot of the things that are made in China, they're not very, um, it, it's just kind of everything looks like a snowman with a face on it. Um, so I'm looking for things with, you know, with arms and legs or interesting heads, um, any kind of anthropomorphic looking animals I love. Um, there's also the series of bunnies that company left in. They also made um, all these really wonderful cats. <laughs> <laughs> they also made the Siamese cats. Um, so, you know, it, like anything that has some detail to it uh, is, is more what I'm interested in. But again, if anybody wants to mail me a box of stuff, I'll take it. <laughs> does that include stuffed animals large stuffed animals yeah I mean like that would be expensive but if you would like to mail me a large stuffed animal I will give it a good home okay <laughs> what's, oh, the time time frame? what's the time frame on your work you you spend uh, hours and hours and hours and hours well, so the thing that happens is um, I start, I have a lot of sitting time, I guess, is what happens. Um, so I never, I never just go in and say like, oh, here's two things. I'm going to make this and just make it right away. Um, I usually find two pieces, look at them, think like, oh, I'm going to put these two together. And then I think about how I want to put them together. And also because, you know, I, um, my, my old boss, John is here and we used to do picture framing together and he um, yeah. <laughs> measure twice, cut once, uh, <laughs> measure twice, cut once. And it's the same with, with this type of thing. Like once I've cut something, 
I mean, I could technically like restore it back together, but that would really be a pain. And so I have to make sure that I'm going to do the cuts um, in the most, in the way that's going to make the work the best. Also, a lot of times you make the cuts in the way you think the work's going to be the best. And then you put it together and it doesn't look right. And then you just have to leave it. So I'm a big fan of starting something. If it's not exactly how I want it, I let it sit for a minute. Um, I'll also a lot of times put, I didn't put any photos like this in there, but um, all, a lot of things are stuffed with like um, balls of paper towels and blue tape to like hold them up or like popsicle sticks um, to support the, the pieces. So I can kind of get an idea of what might work. Um, sometimes I'll hot glue things together temporarily because hot glue will come apart easily. Um, and so just as a trial, um, so yeah, there's not really a good, I, I can't really give you like in a number of hours. <laughs> I mean, I think really the finding of the things takes the most time. Also, a lot of the time what I'll do is I will start something, um, get it pretty much done. So it looks good in a photo, but I haven't done all the totally perfect work for someone to see it in person and then when I know I have a show coming up I'll go like oh my god and I'll just spend like two weeks furiously doing all the super fine detailed work so if it was me I think the painting or the color matching would be take me the longest time but it sounds like you actually you know, the filling and smoothing must be really time consuming yeah, it's it, the filling and the sanding. Um, that is the my most hated part of the process, and it takes the longest. Um, color matching is sort of a thing where once you have a knack for it, it's it's pretty. Um, I mean, if you like math, it's sort of like doing math with color. Um, if you don't like math, that metaphor probably doesn't make any sense. Um, but but it's. Yeah, once you've done it for a long time, it's like, oh, or you see certain blazes and you're like, okay, I understand. I understand what happened with this blaze. And so I'm going to need to make like this base color and then it has a little speckle in it. So I'll make the speckle color. Then usually there's a third thing happening in there for some reason. And then whatever the finish is. Um, and that all feels very natural to me, but this sanding is a, such a pain. <laughs> So I guess you probably don't have any color blindness kind of issues. No, actually, my dad is uh, is is color blind. He's actually shade blind, which is a rare or more rare form of of color blindness. Where so like a black and a navy, um, or like pastels. You know, when I was a little kid, we all used to wear pastel colored socks. And he, if dad matched, if dad did the laundry and matched the socks, you'd open your drawer and you'd have a pink and a yellow sock together, like the pastels, because all the pastels just looked. Um, mm -hmm look the same to him. So, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm lucky in that sense <laughs> that, that I don't, don't, don't have that problem. Yeah. I know it's weird. Cause I, yeah, I have a glaze, an overlap of black and white and people could keep telling me it's green, but I don't mm -hmm. see it. It's <laughs> but like, you know what? There's a lot of, I have, I don't do this, but there people call colors, names that they are not um, all the time oh, yeah, yes. <laughs> and I mean you can fight endlessly with someone about what color something is and so it's more just like if you know for matching it doesn't matter if you want to call it orange or if you want to call it yellow or if you want to call it red it's more just like I know how to get to the color matching point but yeah I can fight somebody all day about what like my husband and I have a recurring fight about what color a certain pillow is. Um, I think it's brown and he thinks it's purple and it's brown. Um. <laughs> so, Deborah, you were telling the story about the first job that, uh, that you brought back the pieces and you didn't want to show. So when did you feel comfortable enough to show what you were doing <laughs> and what, and, and what did your boss say? Um, so after, you know, I, he, he never actually saw me making those lambs. Um, and I, shortly after I made them, I actually, um, he did eventually see what I was doing and he was intrigued by it. Um, but, but shortly after uh, I made the lambs, he actually came in one day and he was like, 
I think I'm going to retire from this business. I'm not going to do this anymore. He had like another business as well. He's like, I'm going to focus on the other one. He's like, but if you want to keep doing this, you're good at it. I'll just have people call you. And so I, wow. Yeah. Literally how, um, I got my, my, that's how I got my business. He did not keep records. So really it was just like, if people called him, he'd be like, Hey, call this other person. Um, but anyway, but so it, was, it, the, it was pretty much, it's like the same as inheriting the business. He might not have given you a Rolodex, but he forwarded right, any yeah, call. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, but also with the, with that work. Um, so I made that one piece and I just kind of loved it and was kind of obsessed with it. And I did show it or it was out during an East Austin studio tour. I think like the, the second one I did, so in 2006 or 2007, um, and people responded in a really interesting way to it. And I was like, okay, um, you know, I started kind of feeling like it was something. And then I have just really started trying to acquire figurines because that was the whole thing is you have to acquire the things to make the work. Um, and so once I'd acquired more, I think I probably had like five or six pieces and I got kind of like, okay, like this is starting to make sense. And I think it was 2010. Um, I, you know, I, so I had them up in my studio for a few years after that with works on paper, um, during East Austin studio tour. And at that time, um, Andrea Millard, who was the curator of what used to be Austin Museum of Art saw them. And she's actually the one that collects the salt and pepper shakers. That's mm -hmm. where I got that cow from. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so she, um, she had come in and she loved them. And so she actually was how, um, I got into the new art in Austin show that was at Austin Museum of Art. And I think that happened in 2011. And after that happened, I was like, okay, this is, this is serious, serious, <laughs> you know, like this is a real thing. And I, um, and I think over time, you know, I'm, I used to try to separate restoration from my work with ceramics, or I thought people wouldn't take me seriously as an art restorer if they knew that I just like made crazy figurines. All no, the time. Are you crazy? That's like, like, that's a bit, the best advertising. If you were <laughs> able to make that look like it went together, of course, you're going to be able to match my piece. <laughs> well, that's, you know, that's what ended up being so funny about it because in my studio in Austin, I did have a, like a shelf like this set up where like people would bring in their broken things and I would have a shelf set up with a few, um, like little figurine sculptures on it and and sometimes people would look and they would they would be like oh my grandma used to collect figurines and she had a cat like that and then they would be like wait <laughs> her cat wasn't like that and then they'd be like what is this <laughs> um, and so I I always love this idea there's like the subversive element to it because it looks so natural and then you also have this like in your mind's eye people are just like I know what crappy figurines look like um and so to be able to like change that and be like wait wait I think I know what I'm seeing but I'm that's not what I'm seeing yeah. um so it's also just have, have you ever done this with um with expensive um um figurines? so normally I use pretty like ch cheap stuff you know I I've been thinking lately because there's a lot of uh, like the company Beam who you know, people may or may not have seen. They make a lot of bird figurines that are just really detailed and really beautiful and really expensive and they break all the time mm -hmm. um, also. So I fix a lot of them, but um, I haven't, I don't know. I haven't really gone into that territory yet. I sort of like the, the low brow um, and like accessible feeling of like the, the throw, almost like the throwaway items. Um, I have used some collectible figurines like Yadro is a big collectible. Yadro is what I was thinking because uh -huh, as a kid, yeah. I, the, I would like, whenever you would go visit uh, rich people, they would like, <laughs> see a little kid and they would all start like trembling because they had all their Jadro uh, figurines. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so I knew the word Jadro before I knew other words because they were yeah, trying so to I, stay away from them. Uh -huh. I actually had a, um, I had someone uh, ask for a commission. So she, her mother had given her a Yadro and the, um, the heads had fallen off and then got glued back on and just didn't look very good. And she was like, I don't like this figurine, but 
what I do like is your sculpture and she had five orange cats. And so I turned the Yadro lady into a, um, like a cat lady, basically. Love it. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Orange cat lady. Um, so, you know, when I find them, I buy them like any, you know, if, if they're in my price range, which is low, <laughs> But yeah, if I come across one, I always buy it. And so nothing's necessarily, it's, it's not off the table. Um, but you know, my, my world is, is lowbrow. I, that's the one I prefer to live in. <laughs> I just Googled Yadro figurines and I'm shocked at the prices. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. This is uh, why I was asking that. <laughs> I, I have several that I have to repair for people right now. In fact, <laughs> So how did the uh, drive-by shows actually work? How did those exhibits, did you end up getting feedback from people? How did all of that just start to finish? How did that work? So um, so the first one where I, I started making that furniture, that was sort of funny because we ended up like we wanted to be in it and we had just found out about it. And we told the guy who was organizing it, he had made this whole Google map that he put everybody on. And he was like, oh, you're like, you're like 12 hours too late. We can't put your studio on the map. <laughs> and so we were like, well, fine. We're an unofficial site now. And so we advertised it ourselves. Um, like, and so normally, you know, I do everything by Instagram. So for that particular show, I would say that you know, 90% of the people that saw it saw it on Instagram. Um, the second show, which was in September, um, was pretty well advertised. <laughs> so um, I, I am part of a curatorial collective that um, runs a uh, space um, in downtown LA in this building called the Bendix Building. And the Bendix Building has a bunch of other galleries in it, including the, the gallery that um, I've been showing with here. Um, and so it, we had the power of, of all those galleries wanting to be a part of that drive-by show and helping us advertise. And at that time in LA, people were hungry to get out and see anything. Um, so it was pr pretty, seemed pretty reasonable to be like, hey, you're not doing anything on Saturday night. Why don't you drive up to the top of the parking garage and circle around a few times? And we did also give people a walk up, you know, like a masked walk up option. Okay. Um, and my friend Carl, who was at the uh, <laughs> at the bottom of the ramp of the garage leading people in, um, I, he, he said we had about 300 people drive through. Wow. <laughs> I only spent an, about an hour on the ground. I did <laughs> not mean to spend any, I, long story short, I really had just meant to do a photo um, with me in the costume. Then I was going to stuff the bear with stuffing and get out because it was September here and it was like, it had been a hundred, it was 105 degrees that day. Oh. And so it was, it was like, I mean, luckily we're lucky here because at night it gets cool, but it was still very hot. And oh, I'm, like, yeah. I'm not going to lay on asphalt in a bear costume all night with cars <laughs> driving around too, because I could hear, like you could, I, you know, I couldn't see out of the head, but I could hear the cars passing and like kind of get a sense of the lights. Um, but what ended up being really funny was with the walk-up guests, I could he hear people talking. <laughs> and they, they didn't think that there was really a person. <laughs> <laughs> and so you could, like I could hear people respond to the work like lots of people wanted to touch the work and sit on it and did sit on it um and touch it which is, is fine um but then I, at one point I like felt a presence and I there was a, a child <laughs> It was, it was like, I could tell really close. And so I moved my hand a little bit and they, they got quite a startle, which was pretty, was pretty fun. Um, so yeah, for that particular show, like to get, to get that to work, we really just had like the social media and email power of, you know, five or six galleries that, that got together to do that. Um, and we also, there was a, a big installation there that involved, um, it was a show of lawn ornaments or sculptural lawn ornaments that was had supposed to have happened like earlier in the year and of course didn't. Um, and that involved like 50 artists or something like that. So we also had those 50 individuals like helping us um, promote and get that together. And also LA is a car culture. So people are just, you know, at home in their cars. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, how much time do you put in uh, between restoration versus concept art with your other work? I'm probably doing, I'm probably at about 70% restoration, eh, maybe six, 60, 70% restoration. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, like as far as actual time, but it's, it's interesting too, because I guess when I'm doing restoration work, I don't have to think about the work. Like yes. it doesn't, it's not intellectual thinking that occurs. And so most of the time when I'm doing restoration work, I listen to just like tons and tons and tons of podcasts and they're all I'm like a generalist. So I love like all the general knowledge. And so that's always running some kind of sucking all that information in um, while I'm doing the restoration work. And that's usually what ends up feeding um, the, what happens with the ceramic work I actually make. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And then, I mean, the nice thing about this, the restoration job too, is that when I do have a show coming up and I know that I need to like, um, you know, finish a bunch of stuff really quickly. Um, I can be like, okay, no, nobody's getting their stuff fixed for three weeks by, um, and that's what I do. Yeah. Yeah. And do you find that you have a queue of, uh, clients that are waiting that are kind of constantly feeding you with the work? That's nice. Yeah, yeah, I have a I have a pretty long queue normally. Um, I have a lot of I have some really consistent clients, and then I just have like normal people who like I'm fixing a music box now for mm -hmm. a woman who you know um, she was like my grandmother bought this at a truck stop, <laughs> but she broke it and she loves it and she wants it back. So um, but yeah, my queue for restoration. I mean, basically my turnaround time is anywhere between like a month and three months or possibly longer if there's anybody watching this that I haven't restored something for, sorry. Um, I'm slow, I'm slow, but it's also a niche, it's a niche market. And so I kind of have the luxury of saying like, well, I can't, you know, I can only hurry so much or like yeah. who, where else is this gonna, you know, there's a limited amount of people you can take this to, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a doll. <laughs> I have one I'm fixing for someone here, actually. <laughs> Anybody else? I have a couple of questions. I don't know if in your work you've done anything where you're just not really having to piece things, but stabilize a, a vessel and anything you can put on the inside that makes it stronger. I've got a couple of pieces uh, some were raku, some were pit fire, and I'm just afraid to pick them up. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> yeah. And I think they need something to strengthen them. Um, so that can be, so it, a lot of what it is, I guess, depends on, you know, if, if they're just for, um, if they're just for show and you don't want to, like, like, if it's not a vase that you want to fill with right. water or something like that, mm -hmm. um, you can, um, you could, I'm just like thinking there's a couple of things you could do. It kind of depends on the nature of the cracking. Like if you had say long, three long hairline cracks that you could see um, that you wanted to stabilize. Um, I'm actually, <laughs> there is this really, really thin, um, it's a very super thin, it's like super glue and it's extremely thin. This is it, it's <laughs> called Zap CA. Then, um, anyway, you can get it at, oh, I guess you guys don't have Blick there. They oh, might carry can, it. We can yours. online Blick. <laughs> but yeah, they have it at Blick. Um, and uh, so that, like, if, you know, if you can see the cracks, especially from the, if you can reach into the inside of the pot um, mm -hmm. and you can, um, you know, run that glue down the cracks. And then basically I would just, um, I mean, it'll, it'll stabilize it without any taping, but you could run the glue down the cracks and then tape it around with glue tape just to hold it a little bit tighter. Mm -hmm. That method could work. Um, if you have like, I know with Raku, sometimes it's like all over cracking. Um, so if you have that kind of situation, you could do something like um, actually make a, like, well, this sounds crazy, but it should work. 
water down Elmer's glue and take a brush mm. and paint that glue all around the inside. Um, and like, again, depending on how loose it is, you could st you could stabilize with, with tape while it's drying, um, but that'll seep into the cracks and give you some, some more stability. Um, one of the good things about that is water, uh, is Elmer's glue is water soluble. So if, um, if you somehow did something you didn't want to do, you can just put it in water or like take a sponge to it and eventually sponge it off. And the other question I'd have is, have you ever done any of the Japanese wabi-sabi technique with the Oh, like the kint kintsugi? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with the, um, so kintsugi is a technique that's supposed to honor the, the break. Um, it's to show you the history of what happens. And so you mix, um, you mix an epoxy resin with a, a gold powder um, and, and then you kind of draw over the lines. So I do that technique occasionally when people ask for it. Um, I think because we, because of the culture that we live in, most people just ask me to hide their mistakes. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it can, I do, I do it occasionally. I think maybe I did two, two Kintsugi repairs last year out of probably like a hundred repairs. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <laughs> Natalie. Yeah. Thank, you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I was wondering how you sign your pieces and whether you try to preserve the maker's mark or like the signature of former artists in the pieces or how you do that. Yeah, so I do. I love if um, things are marked on the bottom. I, you know, I should have, I had a, I do have an image at the bottom of that poodle and it doesn't have any stickers on it because a lot of these things were just marked with stickers, mm -hmm. um, but it does have like I would say it has 10 feet and four of the 10 feet have a number on them from each of the, um, each of the, the manufacturers. So I do love to preserve those things. A lot of the things I don't use, or a lot of the things I use are not marks, but I do preserve the marks when I can. And I try to even preserve the stickers when I can, unless they are wildly confusing. Like I picked up one the other day and it, it just had a made in Taiwan sticker on the bottom. And I was like, that might be a little confusing. So I actually took that one off. Um, but but um, I do, in a way, like see it as a collaborative effort with me and whoever made the piece. Um, so so I always I do preserve, especially I love etched in signatures um, and stuff like that, or like some are glazed on. So I always preserve those. And then normally the way I sign the work, um, if it if it if there's space on the bottom and there's already a sticker or a mark on there, I'll just paint a little signature of mine underneath it um, with the date. Um, otherwise, um, some of them I'll sign like on the side or the um, like on the underside, like the belly, like for horses, I always sign it on the belly, um, assuming they're standing on all four legs because um, they have such tiny feet, it's hard to fit anything on there. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I always just sign with, with a, like a tiny brush and do a little paint. That's neat. Thank you. <laughs> well, this was just so, such an eye opener on so much. So I don't want to stop. If anybody else has questions, um, please unmute yourself and ask. I have one more question. You know, when, when you start doing pottery, and you break a piece or a piece doesn't come out exactly like you want, we spend so much time uh, trying to fix it. Like, do you help people, beginners that are trying to go through that? Or do you tell them, just go try and make another one? Like, like, like what would be your approach to, to, to that? It, it depends. Um, so, I mean, normally it's like the, the techniques and processes that, you, that people who work with clay use are not the same set of techniques and processes that I use. And so if you want to learn the material set, it's possible. It is time consuming and tedious a lot of the time. Um, so like if you're trying to fix a chip, you could do that. Yeah. If you have something that's you know really, really damaged, it's probably just better to to start from scratch and I hate to say it, but it's, it's also funny because it was one of the things like when I was in college and um, 
you know, working more with clay, that was something that I hate, like, I hated putting something in the kiln and just knowing it could just come out like a total disaster. Or even if it gets through the bisque firing and then you're like, I'm gonna glaze it and you glaze it and like the kiln misfires and you're like, it was supposed to be a luster and now it's just like gray. <laughs> and it's horrifying. Low expectations, <laughs> that's my key. Low expectations and then I'm happy every time I open the kiln. There you go. Well, sorry, <laughs> Very low so expectations. Yeah, I would, it's, it's, it's not in your best interest to try to save yourself with restoration. Um, but if, if it's, you know, if it's a small bit of damage or like a little firing crack or something like that, a lot of that, a lot of times that can be like remedied pretty reasonably. What was your favorite piece to work on? Oh man, that's, that's, that's a hard one. Um, you know, I'm like trying to think, because some, sometimes pieces, like I really like how they turn out. I mean, I didn't show a, a really good image of it, but there was a, the goldfish and the donkey. Like I really liked how that turned out. The process of making it was a huge pain. Um, so that was not like, I love what that piece ended up like, but it yeah. was a struggle. Um, and so I was mad at it for a while. And that was one of those ones where I like worked on it and I was like, oh, I put it away. And it, like, it was a long yeah. process. I'm looking back here to see if I have anything just like sitting here that I was like, oh yeah, that was super easy. I mean, right at this moment, I'm super enamored of those, um, Siamese horse cats. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just really liked them. They came together exactly how I wanted, yeah. um, and pretty easily. And I, and I also like it when I can use basically all the parts of something and I've used virtually all the parts of the horse. And so I was like, hooray. Um, so that's a, that's a recent favorite. Yeah. Do you ever um, alter your techniques or materials to try to account for food safety or do most of your repairs wind up not being food safe? I really tell people, I mean, so yeah, basically they're not food safe is the long and the short of it. Yeah, sometimes people will bring, like they have a special platter that they only use on Thanksgiving and it has a chip on the edge. Like that's not gonna, that's, that'll be fine. That's not gonna kill anybody. Um, for the most part, everything is like, see, uh, is sealed in the area that it's repaired with acrylic. Um, so it's, you know, there's not any um, like heavy metals or anything in that, but I'm like, people, so many people come to me and they're like, I broke my favorite coffee mug. And I'm like, I feel really bad for you and your mug. Do you want it to be a pencil holder or, <laughs> or do you want to get a new mug? Um, so, so pretty much, yeah, I don't do, I don't think there is a, there, or there's not a way that I know of to make food safe repairs. Um, that's like, you know, sanctioned by Right. whoever does that OSHA I don't know uh, <laughs> uh, yeah so so it's really just um, I mean they're pretty stable and you can use things to some degree but if it's like a large degree of damage it's just this is decorative now mm -hmm. by the way you said that nobody likes your cats and horses I love them I think from all the pieces that you showed those were my favorite Oh, good. I'm so glad because I was so excited about them and I had four of them in the show and people bought like most of the other things and no one bought the horse cats. And I was like, hey, the only thing they're missing is a horn and then you would have a, a cat horse unicorn. Then you would get me like it's all my favorite things in one. <laughs> well, maybe I'll work on something like that. I do have I do have some unicorn things. Um, I just saw yeah, a unicorn I with the, the dragon tail on your mm -hmm. Instagram. Oh my gosh, that's so cute. Yeah, so that one was a commission for someone. Um, that her, she had had that unicorn as a little girl and then her parents were like, you know, she'd moved out. Her parents were like, you need to get your stuff out of her house. And they shipped her her special unicorn and it broke in shipping. And so she happened to know about me. And so she contacted me and she was like, you know, I love this. I love my unicorn, but I don't want it fixed. I want it to be different. And she had, um, she had tattoos of sea monsters on her arms. And so she wanted it to be like this, um, like sea monster unicorn, you know, kind of like bridge the gap between her childhood and her adulthood. <laughs> Very cool. 
I wanted to just say hello, Deborah. I met you. You had your studio at Pump Project years, yep. way back. And I've always been a fan of your work. And I was in LA when you had the show at uh, the American Museum of Ceramic Art. Oh, yeah. You saw the show at Amoka. <laughs> I drove over to see it. It was fabulous. That was so cool. Oh, what year was that? Uh, that was in, I think it was in 2004. 15. Okay. I feel like, yeah, I think it was in 2015. I'm so glad you got to see that. And I, I'm like, I remember your name. Yeah. <laughs> that was so fun to drive over and see that. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. So I, yeah. I, I, not that I'd forgotten about that show, but I'm so glad you got to see that. that I know. It was so really fun. spectacular. Yeah. It's great to see you. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, I just think those cat horses are probably meant to stay with you now for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe so. Actually, that that one horse that was in the last slide and one of the other slides, the horse with the hand, the finger pointing up like this, um, and the 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 hand on his back, he's staying with me for life because oh. I love him, but because he sometimes falls over. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> And so he has to stay with me because he is accident prone uh, and he needs to be with someone who can fix him. Yes. Well, very good. All right. Well, Deborah, this was just enchanting. Thank you. Good. I hope you guys yeah. enjoyed it. Um, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad I got to, to show my stuff for you. Yes. <laughs> All right. I'm going to stop recording. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you, everyone. Right. You can